It's a whole new world out there when you stop and consider little details often overlooked. Taking a closer look at nature can be done with simple tools. Even your mobile phone can be enough to enjoy exploring and documenting the smaller things out there. When you first begin to use a macro lens attached to your phone like I do in this video, there will be a learning period. Many of the same principles you need to know for macro photography with a big digital camera apply to mobile phone macro photography as well. Consider comparing this way to photograph as having limitations like you would have if you use extension tubes converting a regular lens to a macro lens. For phone macro photography, you add a small macro lens which shortens the minimum focusing distance of the phone lens and it changes your field of view. It thereby allows you to get closer to your subject and magnify the image. You have to deal with a fixed focal length and focus manually by moving your phone to an exact distance from your subject till you have the desired area of the image in focus. And some subjects are better suited for this kind of photography than others. This can be all experimental, depending on the size and textures of your subject. Because some images can be abstract, like this decayed leaf for example, or naturalistic, like this close-up view of the center of a flower. Try tilting the phone slightly in small increments and in different directions. Keep adjusting the distance of your phone camera to the subject until the desired area of your subject is clearly in focus. Any movement too far away or too close to your subject causes the subject to be undesirably blurry. You can hold a flower stem in place with one hand to prevent it from moving too much if it's windy. And you can gently twist or turn a flower, like I'm doing here, to adjust the area in view for a more pleasing photo. But always try your best not to disturb the environment. Just about every smartphone these days has a good camera, and you can have fun with phone photography no matter which phone you have. Some macro lenses will require a case, some do not. Whatever you shop for, you will need to look over the manufacturer's website to see if your phone is compatible with the lens or case for the lens. I've used multiple lenses from different lens makers, but ultimately the results you can get are very similar no matter what brand you use as long as you do not buy a very cheap phone lens. You spend a lot of money on your phone with a good camera, so don't buy a cheap lens, they just don't work very well. I'm currently using an iPhone XS Max, definitely not my favorite phone camera that I've ever used. And the lenses I'm using are by Moment and Olaclip. 
Moment requires a case to fit your phone. I sat on my phone once while it was in my back pocket. I was on a gravel pathway and it scratched the moment lens. But that part of the lens is raised a bit so the glass did not get scratched. So this doesn't affect the image quality. The Ola clip set does not require a case, but they have a different clip attachment depending on your specific phone. This particular clip has been rather bulky and unstable, so it's not my favorite Ola clip attachment. I much preferred the way the earlier versions were designed based on the phone design at the time. I understand the clip designs for the latest iPhones are better now. You might notice I've scratched these too because the clip has fallen off my phone onto hard surfaces multiple times. These lenses come with diffusers but I never use them. I don't find them to be helpful at all, they tend to get in the way when I'm trying to get close to my subjects. Every subject requires a unique focusing distance and tilt or angle of the phone camera, so I find that the diffusers can often restrict my movements. Sometimes I will wipe the lens with a lens cloth, but no matter how much you try to avoid it, dust will build up on the lens, as you can see here from the other side. I have tried using the lens cleaning brush tool by moment on this side, but it does not help. Honestly though, this makes no difference at all for the quality of the images. The dust does not seem to show up in the image as far as I can tell. As is common with most photography, Harsh sunlight will cause blown out highlights and unpleasant shadows. So typically, the best light for macro phone photography is diffused light from a cloudy or overcast sky. Or on a sunny day, you can block the sun or move into a shady area. And just like for many styles of photography, early morning and late afternoon is also ideal. These images are not portfolio worthy, but I'm adding them here to demonstrate the change in exposure from harsh sunlight to more diffused light. You can use a different camera app for your phone to control the light a little, but I find the native camera app works just fine in the right lighting conditions. So that is what I use throughout this video. Later I will briefly demonstrate the Moment camera app. The most important thing you need to quickly understand is that for macro phone photography, your depth of field is very shallow. And there is a substantial fall off of sharpness and detail around the area of focus. Look at these dew-drenched dragonfly wings, for example. Watch how, as I move my phone with a little macro lens, at this angle you can see the only part in focus is that thin, narrow line. Everything else is blurry and there's nothing you can do to change that. But this shows you the small area of focus you are working with. The only thing you can control is the tilt of the lens, which will help you along with your distance from the subject to get your desired area of focus. The size of your subject certainly makes your decision process vary while finding your composition for an image. These flowers are a huge subject for a phone macro image, for example. When a subject is on more of a flat focal plane, you will get more of the subject in focus. And when something has more depth, you will have varying areas in focus. Be creative. You don't always have to be right up close to your entire subject and you don't always have to fill the frame. As you can see, all of your movements are magnified, even the slight movement is quite jarring. Just when you think you have found a nice area of focus, you've lost it. Don't give up, just keep trying and keep moving and take lots of pictures.
Notice again how the flower is moving in the breeze. I stabilize the flower with one hand while photographing with the other. Be curious and on the lookout. One of the best things about scanning flowers and plants to photograph is you'll often find little insects or spiders that are also enjoying the flower. And if you thought the flower was hard enough to focus on, insects can be an added challenge. Consider photographing other parts of the flowers too. Sometimes the leaves can also be interesting, or the underparts of the flower, or the flower buds as well. This bud kind of looks like an alien eye. Searching around the flowers for anything else interesting, I spotted this little jumping spider. I watched and waited for a while, in case the spider tried to catch the fly. But when it turned around, I quickly took a couple of photos and then stepped back to let it continue with the hunt. I find this kind of jumping spider a lot in this garden, so it wasn't long before I spotted another one. If you're taking pictures of a jumping spider and they jump at your lens, just be patient and they'll typically go back to where they jump from, or you can find a way to gently move them back to the plant. I have the best luck with insects or spiders if I move towards them very slowly. And then I take a photo quickly as soon as I see their eye or eyes in focus.
Here you can see, moving in towards the spider slowly and that brief moment when I'm at the perfect distance to see the eyes in focus. Sometimes I have to try multiple times over and over again and a lot of the time I still miss focus. It's just part of the process. My hand is often shaking, the flower is often moving in the breeze, and the spider is still moving. All of that and still there is that split second where everything comes together in the right place and I take the picture. Sometimes I even get two or more photos right after each other that are very similar. In this case the spider is looking in slightly different directions, and it's hard to pick a favourite one. These yellow pollen florets look just like tiny flowers within a flower. I do my best here to focus on one of them. Lucky me, this ladybug landed on me, so I moved it onto a flower and began taking pictures. If you're really lucky, the little moving subject will sit still for a while so you can hone in that focus. But even an insect as small as a ladybug can be a challenge to get entirely in focus, because of their curvature. So, I always try my best to focus on the eyes, especially the eye that is closest to the camera. I will sometimes tap on my screen which tells the camera where I would like to try and focus, and it also sets the exposure according to what is within that area. I slide the exposure slider to bring down the exposure if it seems too bright. To stabilize the phone, ideally you can try and steady the phone by bracing against something firm, like the ground or a branch or rock, fence, post, etc. If you are unable to do that, another way to stabilize your phone in your hands is to lock your arms close to your side. This does not completely eliminate shake, so I also tend to briefly hold my breath for extra stabilization. If you are holding your phone with one hand, while you hold your subject in the other, you can experiment with different ways to secure your phone. Sometimes my fingers holding the phone are stretched in awkward ways, but whatever helps to keep the phone stable. Here is one taken with my DSLR and 100mm macro lens at f2.8 for comparison. This shows that the depth of field is also very narrow when I get close up with my big digital camera lens. 
Because of the years of phone macro photography before I advanced to a DSLR, I found myself trying to mimic the look I got with phone macro photography. This explains why I love soft dreamy close-up images and almost always photograph at the widest aperture possible with my big macro lenses. For any photography with a shallow depth of field, the further your background elements are away from your subject, the more blurred out the background will be. Just as you have to be aware of your backgrounds with a big camera and macro lens, you have to watch for them too in these phone shots. You may have to move some stems or leaves out of the way to clean up the background, or you can position the camera to eliminate the background mess. The background or out of focus areas can affect your composition by pulling your eye away from the main subject if it's cluttered, so pay attention to what is in the background. Try experimenting with the zoom feature on your camera app to magnify the image a little bit more. Keep in mind that the closer you zoom in, the more noise will be introduced into the image. This is why I prefer using a little macro lens attachment rather than only relying on zooming or cropping for macro images. Creating an image in a square format can sometimes help your composition as well by either eliminating distracting negative space or a cluttered background. Some colours are difficult to photograph. This can especially be a problem if you're taking photos on the native camera app with auto settings. Essentially, the same thing that can happen with bright highlights being blown out is happening with the red channel here, and so the red details are being clipped. One way to help with this problem is to slide the exposure down a bit or use another camera app to attempt to control your settings better. Usually underexposing helps for me and in this case I really liked the look of the darker underexposed red and did not change it in the edit. It can also help if you change the direction of where your camera is facing as this changes the angle of light and or the amount of light reaching the camera sensor.
Nature is full of incredible surprises. One of the best things for me since I began macrophone photography has been the discovery of looking for and admiring the tiniest details in hidden places. Look at the amazing detail inside this flower, like tiny flames glowing deep inside. Here is an example using the phone for a close-up picture without the macro lens attached. And for comparison, a photo with my 100mm macro lens at f2.8. You can create a dreamy image if you get very close and have some of the petals cover part of the lens as you get close to your subject. Enhancing the look in the edit can help to get a dreamy soft look as well by using a light colored vignette or using the dehaze tool. Just about anything can be a subject for macro photography. Sure, the tiny things are best suited for these small lenses, but even big things have small areas you can focus on. And it's fun to just go for it and try anything and everything. Some things work and some things don't. Before I do that with this plant, I wanted to quickly grab a photo with my telephoto lens at 400mm. I enjoyed playing with the edit and added a custom vignette. Back to the phone and little macro lens now. I'm searching for an area of the plant to focus on, specifically the center where there are smaller leaves. You might notice that I often like to have my photos in landscape orientation, but sometimes the photo composition works better in portrait orientation. I was admiring the textures of this tree bark and then I noticed the ants. I love watching ants and they are fun to try in video and photograph. The challenge always makes me laugh because I can try dozens of times and barely ever get a sharp image in the right place at the right time. You will notice here I am attempting to use the tree trunk to stabilize the phone with my fingers leaning against the hard surface of the trunk. This does help, only it would be easier if these little subjects would keep still for half a second. And then I saw this large jumping spider, large compared to the ones I usually find, but I decided not to try and photograph it because I noticed it was hunting. 
I went back to look for more ants, and when I returned to find the jumping spider again, I saw that it had caught its prey, so I quickly took one photo just to remember it. But because I didn't want to bother the spider, the image didn't turn out too well. This little wildflower growing by the water's edge provided a good example for why I love to have my phone handy for macro photography. Because for me, when I find a very small subject, I have a hard time getting very close with my DSLR and 100mm macro lens. Here are a couple of examples with my 100mm lens. And now here is one with my phone. Water drops always catch my eye. I especially love to photograph water drops on spiderwebs, but I didn't find any of those on this day. I did see some drops on these big leaves, so I took photos both with my DSLR and phone to compare. Think of everything as a potential subject, even if you think it's too big to focus on. You never know what things really look like until you try to see them very close up. There are amazing patterns and textures on so many different surfaces and plants. At first I thought I would take a picture of this very large flower, but then I noticed the flower buds and found them to be an even more interesting subject. Of course even the buds were still quite large, so I focused on the top of the bud as that was all that could fit into the area of focus. I love exploring the centers of all kinds of flowers. They give you that bee's eye view that is so unique in every flower.
Isn't it amazing how wildlife, including insects, can be hidden in plain sight? Of course, this is once again a very large subject for a very small macro lens, so I just focused on its eye. This bumblebee was drenched either from the rain showers the night before, or possibly it was caught by the sprinkler system. It was clinging onto the overturned flower. I decided to switch to my Oloclip lens system and used it for the rest of this video. I tried various different angles like this low angle to include parts of the flower in front of the lens to give depth to the image. Even though this seemed to be a golden opportunity having a bee sitting quite still like this, it was not really working out too well and the very dark eye was not easy to focus on. Right next to the bee on some of the decaying flowers I found some snails. In this video clip with the phone macro lens, you can see if the tilt is just right and the distance from the snail is just right, I could manage to get the shell and the neck portion mostly in focus. If you do use the native camera app on your phone, you obviously rely on the camera app to make all the decisions for settings automatically. One problem with this is, if you intend to do a series, the white balance could change from photo to photo if you move around at all. Because for each time you tilt the camera and light comes in from a different direction, there is potential for your white balance to change, as you will notice here in these three water drop photos. If you don't want this to happen, use a different camera app to attempt to control your settings manually. While taking photos of the water drops, a little damselfly landed close by. I decided to use my DSLR first because damselflies and dragonflies can be a little skittish. Since I don't have to get very close with my DSLR, I could get at least one photo before trying with my phone. It wasn't long and the damselfly did fly off. No phone photos of this one. Here is an example of another damselfly with my phone. As you can see, because of the depth of field, all that can be in focus from this angle is the one eye and a leg. The exact same thing happened with this fly. I first tried with my DSLR and shortly after it flew away.
These little ink cap mushrooms sometimes show up on grassy areas after a night of rain. I love studying them through the macro lens. Such interesting textures and these appear to be semi-transparent. I had a little fun reminiscing about one of the first videos I made for this channel, photographing these same kind of mushrooms both with my phone and DSLR. Here's another fly. This time I tried with my phone first and thought if it flies away, it flies away. I'm pleased to say I managed to take a photo both with my phone and my 100mm lens. A little skipper butterfly. I want to get close to it, but I did not want to scare it away. So cute and fluffy. Luckily, the butterfly stayed long enough for me to explore photos from all angles. I even had a chance to grab a photo with my big camera as well. I would like to share a little bit about using an app other than the native camera app with a macro lens. This is the Moment app. First here I attempt to adjust focus and use the focus peaking feature. Honestly it is a nice feature that I find unhelpful for the most part. 
Because of the magnified movement that occurs with the macro lens, for me personally, I can judge what is and isn't in focus just as easily without it. And having the feature does not guarantee accurate focusing, because any amount of movement in any direction will immediately change focus. Now I am changing the exposure value slightly and whereas there could be an advantage in some areas using an app like this where you can capture a raw file, I have not had great success in seeing a big difference in quality with such a file versus a JPEG file from a phone. I know there is a vast difference when you shoot RAW versus JPEG with a big digital camera. I have not seen a huge benefit with a mobile phone doing it this way. I do think though that it will be worth it to spend more time experimenting with this. I have however been quite comfortable with my results and the native camera app over the years. I also would like to briefly cover simple focus stacking just to mention that yes, it is possible to do and yes, you can do this the same as you would with photos from a big digital camera. I rarely ever do this, I much prefer the look of an image to be exactly how I captured it. And alter only a few things with colour and exposure and a vignette, if these things are necessary to enhance the photo. I am doing this in Photoshop. I know there are different apps or software that you can use for focus stacking as well. I'm going to show a less than ideal example with only two photos here. One photo captured a portion of the snail in focus and the other photo captured a different area of the snail in focus. I was taking the pictures at an angle so the depth of field was too narrow to be able to get a clean fully focused individual image of the snail. For this example, my first step is to place the one photo on a new layer on top of the second photo. Next, I select both layers. Then select Edit Auto Align Layers. Well, that is what you would normally do if the images were very similar and if the only changes in the images were the areas in focus. Since these photos are not prime candidates for aligning layers accurately, because they were not captured at the exact same angle or tilt of the lens, and I was quite likely further away from the snail in one photo versus the other, I need to make a small adjustment in aligning the layers. I toggle the layer on and off to check that it is more or less aligned correctly. Then I create a mask on this top layer and invert the mask so the layer is no longer showing. With a white brush at 100%, I paint in the small area of the shell that I want to appear from this layer on top of the layer underneath. If I toggle this layer on and off again, I can see the change made so far and if there is any more that I want to paint on or remove some of what I painted on with the black brush. Once again I toggle the layer on and off to see the change. As you can see, the shell shows how different the two images were from each other in the first place. As I said, this is certainly not a great example of focus stacking which you should put much more thought into when actually taking the photos, but it still works well enough as an example of how you can possibly do it if you want to. I want to mention something about taking videos on a phone with the macro lens attached. As you have seen in multiple examples throughout this video, 
Magnifying your subject this way also magnifies every tiny movement you make, or the subject makes. Video is a great challenge with a macro lens, but I would highly suggest you add it to your picture taking routine. It's great to have video as part of the record of what you are seeing in nature. Sometimes I enjoy capturing video because a photograph might not be enough to tell the whole story. For example, I think this is a woolly aphid. I couldn't get a good picture of it so I took video instead just to have documentation of what I saw. This video shows how much the wind was blowing this blade of grass which was weighted with heavy water drops. Amazingly, as much as it was moving, the fast shutter speed of the phone camera managed to capture a decent still image. In windy conditions, you can also wait and watch for patterns in the wind. If the wind shifts or stops, quickly take the shot. There are some special effects you can do for B-roll or just for fun. Besides inching towards your subject from a distance, going from being out of focus to bringing your subject into focus, twist or turn your camera as you move in for a special visual effect. You can face your camera up towards some trees or plants that have light bleeding through. Add your little macro lens which creates some bokeh circles. This works best if there is at least a slight breeze blowing to create movement. Slowly move your phone to help create movement as well. This could make a nice b-roll transition. Here is a tip which involves video. This tends to work for me using my iPhone, because on my phone the focal length for video appears to be longer and the frame is cropped in, thereby magnifying the image a bit more than what you would see in a photo. This enables me to see the subject a little closer and to see what is in focus. If you're having trouble focusing on your subject, try to switch to video to see where you are focusing. Once you have established the correct distance you need to be from your subject for a clean focus area, hold still as much as possible, switch back to photo and take the shot. It is possible to capture a still image while you are in video mode, but the resolution is lower in video mode so I prefer to switch and take a standard photo. I'd like to show a few of my favorite phone macro photos that I have taken over the years. And while they display here, there are a few more things I would like to mention about phone macro photography. You may have noticed that I did not include a section on burst mode or continuous shooting during this video. This approach would be to hold down the shutter button on the phone and create a fast succession of multiple photos. This general idea is to then be able to scan through the photos and select the best one out of the group. It is something that could potentially work for you, but I have had little to no success with this approach in my experience. I typically have more precision focusing on single shots. Regarding using a tripod, I would never consider it, for the same reason that I prefer not to use a tripod when I use my DSLR, namely freedom of movement. It is more practical to consider using one with a big digital camera in certain circumstances, but for phone macro photography it would be rather impractical.
Only in the most controlled setting, perhaps with still life, it could work. But because of the numerous adjustments you have to constantly make in most circumstances, it would be near impossible to position your camera in the right place. Especially out in nature, where you are dealing with the wind or subject movement, and the precision needed in every unique situation. I'd like to mention a little bit of information regarding editing phone photos. If the lighting condition was optimal at the time and place that the photo was taken, I don't need to make very many adjustments. Some areas can be sharpened to bring out details, but for the most part you will not need to sharpen or adjust the depth and range of values or colors because the camera app does a good job with the overall look of the image. Of course, each person has their own style and taste. I prefer to make only slight or subtle edits for a more natural look. I've added more helpful information in the description below this video. You might also find it helpful to read the comments on all of my videos. Often people will share more tips or I will answer questions which include more tips. Additionally, almost every video on this channel and more to come in the future cover tips and details about using a phone macro lens as well as other general photography tips. If you subscribe and click on the bell icon, you will be notified when I add more videos to this channel. Thank you for watching. See you next time.